welcome to the Trombone Corner Podcast, where we feature interviews with trombonists from all over the globe. It's great to have you join us as we talk all things trombone, brought to you by the Brass Arc and Bob Reeves Brass. This is your host, John Snell from Bob Reeves Brass, along with some help from Noah Gladstone of the Brass Arc. Noah, you're looking great today. Hey, John, how are you? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. Who do we have today? Well, today we have, uh, by popular request, Brett Baker from uh, the UK, a really, really phenomenal guy and uh, hilarious. And so I'm, I'm excited to bring his, his interview to everybody today. So, Yeah, Brett is awesome. Uh, and I mean, because he plays at such a high level and he does, like you said, a million other things. So we're going to do a deep dive into all of that to not sound podcast cliche. Uh, all right. So we'll get to Brett's interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors and some trombone news. Hello, loyal listeners. This is Noah Gladstone. I founded the Brass Arc in 2010 to celebrate the love and passion for legendary brass craftsmanship. I wanted to share my joy for the best gear and bring it to the forefront of musicians' minds through the development and cultivation of modern equipment with roots firmly established in the classic designs of the vintage masters. Bob Reeves Brass is a world-renowned mouthpiece maker of the highest quality and has been handcrafting mouthpieces for professional trumpet players for over 50 years. Together, we are excited to bring a premium line of handcrafted mouthpieces to the trombone community inspired by rare and vintage classics, and modernized for the needs of today's musician. Models are available in a variety of sizes, from small and large tenor, bass, trombone, euphonium, as well as custom sizes. We also have artist models available, as used by David Rejano, Jay Friedman, and Charlie Vernon. Visit BrassArc.com or TromboneMouthpiece.com for more information, and remember to follow us on Instagram, at the TheBrassArc and at Bob Reeves Brass. Back to you, John. Well, wonderful ad read as always, Noah. Uh, oh, thanks. I think I'm getting on? better at that, actually. It, every every time, every time, practice makes perfect. Absolutely. Uh, any, anything going on at the shop? You guys got any uh, holiday sales going on or end of year? Um, not yet. Just you know, trying to survive and 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 ship out boxes and pack stuff and do all the things that go along with running a small business, but. Uh, you know, doing my best to keep up with emails and answering people's questions, but uh, it's it's been tough the last uh, last couple of weeks. But um, yeah, some exciting stuff. I, I, I as I mentioned last time uh, on our last episode, uh, M and W trombones, Stevens trombones uh, from Vermont, made by Steve Shires, and Marcus Leichter instruments from Germany. Um, I do have a few uh, Music Hog instruments left. I have an alto trombone that was shown at uh, the International Trombone Festival in Salt Lake this year that's on a special, uh, as well as a Sarah Goldberg uh, cut bell hog trombone, both really, really excellent from our friend Fabian at uh, Music Hog. Sounds sounds like some fun holiday shopping. So uh, all of those are at Brass Arc. You have them all up on the website? They're all up on the website. So check out BrassArc.com and, you know, a see labor what I got. Of love. Exactly. A labor of love. How about, uh, how about it uh, over at Reeves down the street? How are you guys doing? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we've we've had some great traveling this year, uh, and uh, it's never too early to plan. We uh, so you folks uh, in the Texas area, uh, February in uh, San Antonio, we will be at TMEA, the Texas Music Educators Association Conference. Uh, I don't have the exact dates; it's usually around Valentine's Day, uh, second week of February there. And uh, so, those of you who don't know, I mean, everything's bigger in Texas, and uh, even though it's a Texas Educators Conference, I mean, it's. I would say it's even bigger than the NAM show out here. Uh, I mean, it's tens of thousands of people, uh, all kinds of vendors from music publishing to, you know, they have bus companies for, <laughs> you know, for marching bands, uh, things like that. But a, a huge, huge selection of instrument manufacturers, case manufacturers, things like that. So we will be there. Oh, long story short is we will be there with the full uh, Reeves Brass Arc line. So be sure to look for our booth there. at I, I hear they may have oh, breakfast have tacos there, too. In Texas, oh, we're gonna have breakfast tacos. We're gonna we actually do a side trip to Austin to get some barbecue. I mean, we we have to live it up. Uh, but by all means, come by the booth, even if it's just to say hi and say hi. You're a podcast listener. You don't have to buy anything, and we'll still smile at you. Uh, but it's a great opportunity because we we will have the full line. 
small shank, large, you know, large shank, bass trombone. Uh, we'll even bring a bass trumpet or an alto uh, piece this time. Uh, and we'll all always have the mutes that we carry. We'll have the Yupon mutes and the Olven mutes and uh, all of that stuff. So TMEA, February, put it on your calendar. If you're in and around uh, San Antonio, it's something you don't want to miss. Other than that, we're just getting ready for the holidays. So uh, yeah, we're, we're excited. Can't believe 2023 is almost over. So with that, let's, uh, you know, that's enough talking. Let's get right to our interview with, with Brett Baker, shall we? Let's do it. Well, we're so honored to have our guest today, Dr. Brett Baker. Brett is a distinguished trombonist, educator, and music advocate from the UK. With a longstanding tenure as the principal trombone for the Black Dyke Band, he's also noted for his roles as an artist for Michael Rath Brass Instruments and as marketing lead for Dennis Wick and Alliance Products. An influential figure in brass music education, Baker is also recognized for promoting new compositions for the trombone and has significantly contributed to the brass music community through various leadership roles, teaching, and performance endeavors. Without further ado, here's our interview with Brett Baker. All right, joining us all the way across the pond and from the UK in the trombone corner is Brett Baker. Brett, thank you for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure. No problem at all. I'm really thrilled to be here. Awesome. Well, let's get kick it off right with how you got started. How did you get started in uh, with trombone or with brass instruments? Yeah, uh, it's, um, I guess, pretty typical to a lot of players in that my father was a trombone player. And so because of that, I would say he wasn't a particularly good player. He would tell everybody he was amazing. But um, uh, he started me off uh, in a local village brass band at the age of 10. And uh, that's something that I carried on doing. He was very sporty as as well as very musical. And uh, so he enjoyed uh, trying all sorts of uh, activities, whether it be judo, boxing, cricket, rugby, uh, soccer, as you would say over there, all those different things. Um, and the one thing that I seemed to keep going was was playing the trombone. And it was trombone right from the age of 10. I didn't start on any other instrument. And um, I guess it was just one of these things that came pretty naturally compared to some other people but um it was it was working with a lot of adults at first because there weren't a lot of youth bands in my area um and so that was a bit terrifying to start with but as i progressed it seemed to become more enjoyable it became more social and so that's really how i got started and how, you said you were uh, you were pretty young you said 10 yeah 10 years old and okay. uh, so um there's this sort of unwritten rule in the UK that if you're under 10, then your arm isn't long enough to play the trombone. But that was before the days of triggers and valves and things like that. So things have changed. Were you starting on a Besson, uh, Besson trombone or what did you have first? It, it was a Boozy and Hawks. So uh, Besson bought Boozy and Hawks uh, many, many years ago. And so it was one of those old Boozy and Hawks trombones. One of those, uh, you've probably never seen them in the States. Maybe you had uh, some of the other manufacturers that did this, but it was like a frosted bell. If you've I've ever seen, seen it, that. yeah. Mm -hmm. And horrible slides, so, usually. Absolutely dreadful. Yeah, I mean, I'd got, I'd got a bicep like Popeye from playing exactly. on one of those for many exactly. years. Exactly. Um, terrific. And then, you know, so you you decided pretty early on that you wanted to be a professional musician, I would say, and then walk us no, through after that. No, no, you didn't. I, no, I, I didn't. No, I was going to become a bank manager. That's what I wanted to do. I went and uh, I took um, our sort of advanced certificates. Uh, so before you go to college, in effect, um, I took music. And my music teacher was really, really bad. So uh, we ended up sitting the wrong paper as a result. Of that bad. Mm. So I did really well in my performance, composition, and um, the um, those sort of aspects of playing. But when it came to the history paper, because this teacher of ours uh, set the wrong paper, we ended up failing that bit. So I didn't do particularly well in my music studies. So I went on and did an economics degree so that I was, I thought I'll go into economics. Um, 
And after that, I thought, do you know what? I think I prefer music. So I then went and did a master's in music and I then went on and did a doctorate in music. So it's at that point when I was about 26 that I decided, actually, I think I might go down the road of, of trying to be a professional musician. And um, I would argue that I'm sort of, I'm, I'm not a professional musician. I would say I'm a semi-professional musician because I also earn my money doing a lot of other things. So for instance, teaching, um, arranging, uh, presenting, uh, working for Dennis Wick products, which is what I do now four days a week. So I, I'm sort of one of those um, people that I've always had a proper job as well as being a musician. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's, that's been important because I'm, I'm, I would say I'm pretty grounded as a result of that. I'm pretty realistic, but I, so I've always um, played and been, I've always been paid to play as it were, but um, that's not necessarily always been my main source of income. I think that's great. And uh, obviously I do a lot of things too, but uh, you know, living uh, in the world that we live in now is with music. It, I think is really important for a lot of people to, realize that there are other things to do in music outside of just performing and that doesn't diminish your performing chops or at all it's just you know a way to survive and continue to thrive in the music business so uh applaud you on that one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you um, yeah <laughs> terrific <laughs> I, I just think it's super, super fascinating and and in in the modern age this is how this is how it is i think for people to be really successful yeah and i mean uh, it's i think quite similar in the states but over here a lot of the orchestras are now part-time positions anyway so you might only have three three and a half days a week as opposed to five six days a week um, i'm not sure if that's the same in the states um, but as a result of that a lot of the orchestral players are having to do other things uh, because otherwise they just can't survive and so uh, they're uh, they've always been associated with the local conservatoire wherever the orchestra is but i think that's become um sort of standard now over here so i i taught at salford university um for many years and i was actually a program leader there for the last six years um before i then went into um the whole sort of instrument manufacture and then accessories manufacturing so that's i've sort of gone full circle and ended up going into education and then coming out of education and going back into industry because that's that's what i did for six years before i then decided i was going to become a um well try and earn some money as a musician so if, brett if you would could you take us into your decision i mean because that's uh, to to go back into music uh, after getting all of those degrees in economics and going, you know, that banking route, because that's, I mean, especially in your mid twenties, I mean, that's got a, uh, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of implications there in terms of the security and of going into a banking job or management job, something like that. So what, what did that look like? Yeah. So I, uh, I was lucky in my, um, university course that, uh, I was sponsored to do the the course, and so I, I guess if you've got a, a leaning towards economics, you're pretty frugal with your money anyway. And so I, I was able to work out ways in which I could get paid to be at university. And so there was a company that sponsored me, a local company, and it just happened to be that that company uh, was owned by a, 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 a yeah, we can call him a millionaire. That's not that's not unusual these days. So he was a millionaire that had uh, quite a bit of money. And I used to go on weekends and be his gardener. And so as a result of that, I said, well, you know, are you doing any training courses? Could I do some management courses at your company? And he said, yeah. And so he sponsored me through university. Um, and I did that. And I felt it necessarily after the course, because I was doing a lot of playing up in the, the north part of Manchester is where my studies were, whilst I was from the West Country, the West of England. And so after my studies, I went back down south and I worked at that company for a number of years. And that was um, actually selling fork truck tires. That's what I did whilst playing uh, on the weekends and playing almost every evening. I was in the day um, traveling around the country, um, trying to make sure that all these different fork truck companies had tires on their trucks before they went out the door. And that was my job for a number of years. Um, and this is going to sound really cheesy now, but this is absolutely what happened. In 2000, I went over to New York and I did a concert uh, in New York as part of um, a brand new uh, institute that was set up. It was called the Gramercy Institute that was set up by a, a, a gentleman that 
invited me over for some reason. I have no idea why, but he invited me over and said, would you do some recitals and a couple of clinics? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And whilst I was there, and I mean, this seems so bonkers now how this all happened, but this guy that was um, a professional trombone player from St. Louis was in New York trying to earn a living as a, as a freelancer. And uh, he said, I'll take you around New York. I'll show you everything. So we went up the Twin Towers and we're on the Twin Towers. And he said to me, he said, if you're not very happy with your job, then you've got to follow your dreams and become a professional musician. Just give it a go. He says, what have you got to lose? You could always go back into your current job because it was quite a stable job. And um, because I knew the owner of the business anyway. Um, I felt I could probably pop out and if it didn't work out, I could probably pop back in and have some sort of job um, in, in that line of work. So uh, that was that was really influential. And I thought, yeah, I'm 26, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to take a master's degree in music and I'm going to go and do uh, and I'm going to study music seriously if we put it that way and and do the whole orchestral route and do some jazz and uh, try all that and so that's what I did and um, I sort of thought you know when you're a youngster and you look at people and you go oh they're really old because they're in their 40s so they must be old that's the way I felt uh, when I was 26 I thought well I'm I'm ancient now anyway what have I got to lose I'm almost retired so I thought I'll I'll go and do this I'll I'll go and try to uh, make it in the music business. And um, I guess I did make it in the music business, but no way was it what I thought. I thought I would end up playing trombone all day long. And actually, it's far more interesting than that because I get to teach, I get to conduct, I get to arrange, I get to play on various projects, I get to do um, uh, voiceover and playovers and things like that. And why not? That That's really interesting. And it's far more interesting than sitting in an orchestra and counting bars rests and reading a book, because that's what reality would have looked like if I'd become an orchestral player. Yeah. Fascinating. And, I mean, you, you said you were playing during this time while you were working and getting these degrees. Uh, you know, what did your practicing look like? How were you able to keep yourself at such a high playing level, even throughout the time when you were working? It's It's really tough and that's always been uh, a challenge and i guess what i've always been if nothing else is very organized so i always found time to practice and i say this to my students all the time so i've got to be in this sort of frame of mind but um i would um let's say i'd work at um, 8 30 till 5 30 if that was a, a normal day shift but then there'd be a, a couple of hours then where i could practice most of the time I would have rehearsals in the evening, whether it be um, whichever band I was playing with at the time. And then in between that, because that was normally twice or maybe three times a week, I'd have evening rehearsals. But then in between that, I'd be practicing a good two or three hours a night. And even when I had a rehearsal on, I'd make sure that I'd get at least half an hour of practice in because I was, was of the opinion that practice is very different to performance. And so even if I'm performing every night, that's not going to make me a better player. I still have to practice. Quick, let's dig into that. I love that. <laughs> so what, what, what is the difference between your practicing time? and Because I, I know a lot of college students are like, oh, I'm in rehearsals all day. I don't really need to practice because I'm getting face time with the instrument. To, for you, what's the difference? And that's what a lot of my students will say to me is that I don't need to practice today because I've I've been in a rehearsal. Um, as a trombone player, then you're going to have occasions when you're sat there listening to everybody else rehearse and you just sat there. You can't play. Um, so I would suggest that um, rehearsing is when you're doing something on your home, on your own, practicing the bits that you cannot play. Um, I'm not a great believer in practicing ensemble pieces. Uh, I might practice solo pieces and I'll practice studies and I'll practice routines. And what I'll do is I'll sort of, if I put it this way, I'll step those pieces up. So if I'm working on a Coprash book and it's in a certain octave, I'll play it up the octave or I'll play it down the octave or I'll play. Um, now I've got to be careful with my terminology, semi quavers. So that's, uh, eighth uh sixteenth notes sixteenth notes yeah so um i do things like that and so i would step it up a little bit in terms of what's happening there uh, a lot of my early teachers were trumpet and cornet players they weren't trombone players i didn't get to have a trombone teacher um 
particularly in a concentrated way until I went to music college. And so because of that, I was always technically proficient because I'm used to playing pieces that valve players would normally play. Um, and as a result of that, I would um, challenge myself with a lot of the um, standard trombone repertoire, whether it be uh, the trombone Arben or the Coprash or the La Fosse or whatever it is. And I'd find those things to be a little bit boring. So I'd, I'd just make them more interesting and change the, change the key or change the octave or change the, move something up a fifth and do that sort of thing. Um, and if I wasn't challenging myself and it wasn't uh, what I say to my students uh, in terms of it's considered practice, it's, it's really focused practice, thinking about what I'm doing whilst I'm doing it. If it wasn't that, then I wouldn't do it. So um, I get bored very, very quickly. So <laughs> unless it's interesting for me, I wouldn't bother doing it. And so that's, that's what I tended to do. My philosophy has always been push on the next level, try and find something that's more difficult than the piece that I've just been playing. Awesome. Awesome advice. Yeah. And, and the other thing I wanted to touch on, because you mentioned early on that you, you were kind of a natural, you know, picked up trombone fairly easily. You know, and I think there's this misnomer out there where folks, you know, especially accomplished players think they were just born with the instrument in their hand and they could just play. But, you know, what you were talking about, even with your work, even with your rehearsals, you're still practicing hours and hours and hours a day. You know, that's there is a lot of work behind success, not just, hey, we were born with an instrument in our hands. Absolutely. So. And, and I, you know, I always try and uh, explain to people that it is very much like that. There's no such thing as natural talent. Uh, it's more a question of you've got to work at it. If you want to succeed in whatever it is you're interested in, and it could be, you know, it could be painting, it could be uh, playing the trombone, whatever it might be, you've got to put the time in. Otherwise, it just won't work. And what I mean by natural, I guess, is that you get to a certain stage when you're familiar with the trombone in your hands and it feels like it's part of you, then it's becoming natural. But that process takes a lot of, time and effort so um that's that's probably what i mean by by natural i certainly wasn't gifted if i put it that way i wouldn't have used that word it's it's more hard work and sweat and uh, and i can remember the very first year uh, of playing i did this solo competition and I, I i was last place so i i came last out of all the different competitors and i was really miserable about that and i was really sort of cheesed off and thinking well what am i doing this for what's the point and they gave me the prize for um, the player that showed the most potential, even though I'd come last. And I thought, yeah, well, things aren't that bad. Then I'll keep this going. I'll, I'll see what happens with it. And so, um, yeah, who, who knows? I might have, I might have just packed it in otherwise. And uh, I, that, I would have been very sorry if that was the case because I've had a lot of enjoyment out of playing the trombone. Well, that's very inspiring. Um, any, uh, any of your teachers particularly influential on you or all of them? Um, you know, we didn't. You mentioned you you were mostly taught by cornet and trumpet players early on, but when you actually got into school, um, any particular John loves when people really... say that, by the way, because he's a trumpet player, so he likes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no wonder well, you I'm turned the... out so well. You started with a trumpet player. There exactly. We go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, absolutely, and I mean that's still the case today. In that my my mentor, as it were is a gentleman called Howard Snell, who's a trumpet player uh, and played in the LSO for many, many years and a great arranger, great player, great conductor. Uh, just a very, very interesting guy who lives in France. And so I would just get on, on Skype or Zoom and just have a chat with him and just say, hey, what would you do in this circumstance, in, in this situation? And he's great for that, just sort of getting me to reflect on <laughs> what I'm doing well and what I'm doing badly. So even now, I'm still very much influenced by a lot of uh, people in the trumpet world, let's say. Uh, one of my biggest influences was a, a gentleman called David King, and there's a lot of David Kings out, out there, but this is a gentleman that um, was at Salford University for many years, an Australian gentleman that played the cornet and came over to the UK and made a massive impact. Um, in terms of uh, once I was at music college, I thought it was going to be important to then look at getting some trombone teachers because that's why I was there. So I thought I need to look at this orchestral side of playing because I was doing um, mainly wind band, uh, brass band, and a little bit of jazz at the time. I wasn't doing any orchestral at all. And I thought I need to sort of look into this area of playing, which I did. And so my teachers then were a, a gentleman called Christopher Holding, who I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of. He now teaches in in Essen, but at the time he taught at the Royal College of Music in 
uh, the Royal Northern College of Music, which is Manchester-based. And also then he moved to Birmingham Conservatoire and did some teaching there. So he's um, been a, a, a big sort of influence in terms of my approach to um, playing and orchestral playing in particular. Um, but then I also had uh, only a few lessons off uh, the great Dennis Wick as well. So to then work for Dennis Wick Products was just... Um, something I never even entertained. And so I had a couple of lessons uh, off Dennis and he is just very, very inspirational, very, very uh, considered, very informative. And he would just watch you play and then would just make some comments. And in very few words, he'd be able to suss out your playing, uh, understand what it is you needed to do. And then you just go away and do it. And um, his his um, phrase that I'll never forget was uh, there's, two things you never can you never want to criticize a trombone player for one is their driving and the other one is their tuning and he said now which one do you think i need to criticize so it's like oh okay it's probably my driving then isn't it um so uh he, he's, he is he, he was, definitely um, has gravitas for sure uh, <laughs> a, a very uh, amazing man he walks in the room and everyone just looks at him <laughs> absolutely so, he's absolutely. incredible and he's He's 92 years old and still going strong and uh, uh, still has a lot of stories that he can tell you. So uh, that that was Amazing. very influential. Um, and then um, I guess a lot of time then it was, was colleagues that I was playing with in ensembles. So I was very fortunate to play in a band called uh, Williams Ferry Engineering Band when I was studying at uh, Salford doing economics. And they just happened to be a very, very fine band at the time. And the players within that band, uh, the, 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 in, in particular, the solo cornetist and the, the solo tenor horn player, um, they were just a dream to listen to. They would just play a melody in a certain way. And you'd think, right, that's how I need to play a phrase. That's how I need to breathe. And uh, the tuba section of that band as well is is legendary. And I used to just listen to the band playing and think, why on earth am I sitting in this ensemble? I'm not good enough to be here. Um, and very quickly had to learn um, to become good enough to be in that ensemble. And fortunately, I got there. Otherwise, I think they would have fired me. And they, they, fortunately, they didn't. Uh, so that was very, very inspirational. Uh, and playing in the National Youth Brass Band of Great Britain, which is a wonderful institution that we have, have over here where you can go along as a, as a as a young player and be educated by um, a lot of the leading tutors uh, that are in the, the brass band movement. Uh, and now I'm a trustee of the, the National Youth Brass Band of Great Britain, and I'm very, very keen to encourage other players um, in the UK. And also, um, uh, most countries tend to have a national uh, youth orchestra, a national youth wind ensemble, a, a, a brass band. So I'd always encourage young players to do that because you might think you're good, and then you go along and play the national level and you realize you're not that good and that you need to step it up a bit. So um, that was really important for me. So those have been my uh, big influences really um, so far. And um, I think it's important to say that you're never too old to learn. I'm still le picking up things and learning from people. Sometimes it's the people I teach as well. They'll say, oh, do you know this piece of music? Or they'll say, uh, I play this note in a certain way. Have you ever done it like that? And I'm like, no, let me give that a try. That sounds like a great idea. Why have I never thought of that? So um, inspiration I, I is everything. We everywhere. had brass bands like you all have uh, over there here. We just don't have that kind of community of uh, brass ensemble playing in the United States so much, but maybe someday it'll happen. Um, it's it's growing. I, the NABBA it, festival is getting there, but it's the thing is, it's such a massive country anyway. So you're talking about the size of Europe a place that then has to have, you know, in proportion would need to have thousands and thousands of brass bands. And at the moment there's hundreds there, probably just about a right. hundred, but it's growing. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's a brass band being set up in the U S about once every month. And so it's scary how quickly these things are, are, are growing. And it's normally retired high school teachers that are setting them right, up and right. getting involved in that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of work, too, to just organize that and rehearsals and people's schedules and stuff. But uh, I think it's great. And uh, it's such a great uh, genre of, of music, especially for brass players, of course. But uh, just to get to play repertoire you wouldn't get to play uh, in a brass ensemble is just it's like almost being in a choir with the intonation and 
uh, it's great for your ears and development. Uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about your involvement with uh, Mick Rath and Dennis Wick, since you kind of brought it up already, and uh, how that all came to pass. Yeah, so I first met Mick Rath at uh, the New Orleans International Trombone Festival, and uh, that was back in, I think, 2005. And I'd never met him before, even though um, he wasn't, he, he was only about an hour and a half drive. The factory's only an hour and a half from where I was situated. And um, so I thought, uh, it, I just happened to be on the plane on the same flight as him going back. And uh, uh, we, we just started talking. And um, I can say this now because they don't make the instrument anymore. But at the time, I was playing on a Besson. And uh, the Besson, uh, I would say, made some really good trombones. There was nothing wrong with them at all. They stopped making them, and that's fine if that was their decision. The two that I had were absolutely great, and they worked really well um, in terms of what I needed to use the trombone for. But the third one uh, that I acquired, it just never quite worked the same way. And I couldn't work out what was wrong with it, uh, whether there was some um, there was a blockage in one of the pipes or something like that. So I just said to Mick, look, can you have a look at this instrument? Because I'm just not getting on with it. And the other two that I've had have been amazing. I'm not looking at changing, but I, I just want to find out what, what's wrong with it. And so he said, yeah, I'll take a look at it. So, of course, then there's a load of instruments on the stand all just lined up. And he says, so while I take a look at this instrument, do you want to have a go on one of my instruments and just see if there's anything that you like here? It'd be good to get your feedback and all this. Anyway, I picked up one. I had a blow, blew a couple of notes on it and I was like, right, okay, so this is where I'm going wrong. I need to be playing on one of these. And uh, within a, a year of that, um, Besson stopped making trombones anyway. And then uh, they, uh, their emphasis really was then Courtois in terms of the buffet group and all that sort of thing. So. Um, I thought, yeah, I, I, I might because uh, there's no point being a, a Besson artist anymore because they're not going to make the instrument. So I, I started talking to Mick, and we. Um, it took me best part of a year to then try different designs and different types of trombone, and ended up on what is their uh, orchestral instrument, the R4. Uh, they make an R6 now, which is more like what you'd, you'd call the Alcart Con equivalent. But at the time, and I'm still playing on the R4, and I've been playing on it for the best part of 18, 19 years now, and it works like a dream for me. It's just absolutely great. But then any modular instrument is going to be great. If you can pick the slide you want and the tuning slide you want and the, the bell you want, of course you're going to find an instrument that you like. It, it makes sense rather than picking one off the shelf. So um, I've been very happy with that situation. Um, when it comes to Dennis Wick mouthpieces, uh, I'm probably one of the few people that Dennis Wick was not able to convince that I should play on his mouthpiece. Uh, always played on the mutes, always loved the mutes, really reliable, worked well for me. But I didn't like the mouthpieces back then because the rims were very, very sharp for me. Uh, it was very edged rim. And uh, I've always had that in my head. I guess that's that's the issue with a lot of players in that you play a certain instrument, even if it was 20 years ago, and you go, I didn't like that back then. So even if they've made improvements, if they've changed it, you've got that opinion that I tried it back then, didn't work for me, so it's not going to work now. Anyway, um, when uh, I started talking to Stephen Wick, who's Dennis's uh, son, and also um, Stephen Greenall, who at one point was... Um, the director of um, the uh, International Trombone Festival, whilst at the same time I was th there as secretary. And so uh, I knew Stephen very well. He ended up being CEO at Dennis Wick. And he said, why don't you come on board and work with Dennis Wick in the marketing department? Because we're going to set up a new department and uh, we, we think you'd work really well and fit into this um, situation that we've got so i went along and the first thing he said is that well you've got to try our mouthpieces because there's no way you can work for this company and then play on a different mouthpiece so i said okay yeah i'll do that and um it was good for me because i was able to try a full range of different mouthpieces <laughs> on my time frames trying all the different ones because i'm in marketing so guess what i can use as many different mouthpieces as i want try them um and um I, I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I play on three mouthpieces now, depending on what it is the gig is. So I've got um, 
an Alliance mouthpiece, which is a Euphonium mouthpiece, which Dennis Wick make. Uh, I also play sometimes on a Stephen Mead Euphonium mouthpiece. I play on a classic uh, four um, BL, I think it is now. No, it's an ABL. I'm playing on a four ABL for a lot of the uh, ensemble work that I do. Um, and so I've got these different mouthpieces that I alternate on depending on what uh, what the need is. And sometimes I play on a heavy top mouthpiece if it's a big orchestral piece, if it's Mahler or if it's uh, something really sort of quite heavy, I'll play on a heavy top mouthpiece. If it's something like this weekend I'm playing in the Albert Hall and it's sort of fairly standard brass band repertoire, it's quite orchestral in its feel, it's quite symphonic, uh, so I'm just playing on a classic mouthpiece and I'm thinking I need to sound like I've got to have LSO in my mind when I'm playing it, whilst if I'm then playing um, Philip Spark, uh, who's a very brass bandy composer, then I might change it and I'll go on to maybe uh, a euphonium mouthpiece. So um, I've discovered this whole new world <laughs> after 30 <laughs> years of playing. I'm now in this situation where I can use different mouthpieces for different things. I must be a trumpet player. I was going to say, we can hear the influence of your uh, early teachers creeping in finally. <laughs> Just don't get one of those uh, mouthpiece pouch belt loops that they wear at the, you know, then the, the fanny holster, pack, right? the holster, <laughs> mouthpiece holster. Then then we're going to have an intervention, Brett, because... I'm yeah. going to look like Batman if I had one of those on my belt, wouldn't I? You <laughs> your know? utility I mean, it's, belt, it's... exactly. <laughs> Yeah. You know, there's an idea <laughs> I, for a mar marketing right there, I think, uh, you know. We do make one of those utility uh -oh. trumpet things oh, that you put four uh... mouthpieces in. I've not seen them lately, but I know that they used to have those things. And I used to think back then, how can anybody need, have a need for four different mouthpieces in one gig? And I've never changed in a gig. I always pick the one up that I'm playing on at the time, and that's the one I use. But but it's tempting now. It really well, is. Well, there definitely is a stigma, I think. If you change your mouthpiece like mid-gig, everyone kind of gives you a side eye like, uh, what's going on over <laughs> yeah. there? You know, but why not? I mean, you know, if trumpet players do it. <laughs> Come back when you've changed mid-phrase and then we can talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, I'm not even changing the size of mouthpiece. It's not like, oh, I'm, I've got a piece of that's really high, I'll just switch up and get a shallow mouthpiece for those three notes. It's not even that. They're all the same size. They're all 4AL equivalent, but they're just different shapes for diff because they, they make a different sound quality. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've not I've... even tried that, you know, where you go, oh, I'll tell you what, let's just go and get, I'll now put a trumpet mouthpiece in and play this double super D I've got to get. Let's do that on, on a trumpet mouthpiece. No, I haven't tried any of that. We were at the Royal Albert Hall this weekend, so maybe you can uh, get inspired yeah. and pull out a mouthpiece. And... <laughs> yeah. um, what, what, is, what is that you're playing? Sorry to jump in. Though. Go, what, go, what, go ahead, what John. What are you playing at the Albert Hall? Is... Oh, so it's a piece of music called Of Men and Mountains by Edward Gregson. And so it's the national finals. If you've ever seen a film called Brassed Off, it's, uh, it's that story. And uh, so we qualified in the March uh, with the Yorkshire Area Champions and then 20-odd uh, bands go and play in the Albert Hall this weekend uh, to sort of have the, the grand final, if you like. And so the, the test piece is it's an old piece. It was first written for this competition 20 years ago and then it was dismissed because it was too long. How things have changed because back then, you know, a 20 minute piece, you can't play a 20 minute piece in a contest. So now that's quite normal to do a, a sort of piece that's between 15 and 20 minutes long. So it was it was very much I remember it being deemed as just too long to play in a competition. And here we are playing it 20 years later. Um, and it is very symphonic in its approach. And the trombones are very much used in a symphonic way. Uh, there's lots of, uh, funnily enough, there's lots of mute changes in it. So I'm juggling mutes for 20 minutes as, as, I, as I play. So that's the biggest challenge is making sure I've got the right mute in over two and a half second show. period. Yeah, definitely part it, of the show. It, very much so, yeah. And, and that's, that's with the Black Bag Band? Yeah, that's right. So that's Black so Dyke. So uh, I've always been curious, what does the preparation for something like that look like? I mean, are you guys rehearsing every day, every week? You know, it's punishing. That's that's all I need to say is that, um, and it's worse if it's a European or if, uh, what I mean by a European is that that tends to be a competition where you play two pieces on the same weekend. So that can be really hard work because then you're basically looking at three weeks beforehand where you're pretty much in the band room 
every night of the week for three weeks. Um, plus concerts because we tend to do at least one concert if not two a week so we're doing concerts while still then putting all these rehearsals in and rehearsing the test piece before the concert and sometimes after the concert depending on how we're doing so it's not unusual to be playing uh, for three hours uh, a night um, as you get towards the competition that eases off and it becomes more um that you're running the piece so tonight we've got what's called the open rehearsal and so we'll go along and we'll probably play two concert items and then we'll run the test piece in front of an audience so that we can become match fit in terms of performance because there's very much in brass band terms a difference between rehearsing and playing a piece and it being ready to perform and then having a performance experience on that piece which is what a lot of bands do so we've got that tonight uh Hence why I need to finish at yeah. a certain time so I can get over there. But so, uh, and we'll do that in a, a local town hall. And then um, basically then the conductor will go away, make some notes, have a listen to the recording, and then he'll have a, a, a list of changes that we'll make to the piece. Um, and bear in mind, we've already played this piece in a concert last weekend and the weekend before. So we're already in terms of it's a performance standard, but it's not a, contest standard until we've got to the end of this week Jeez. <laughs> that's intense and and the, the players in the group i mean are they all like yourself are they all professional semi-professional or there's still community players in there Does um it depend on the group yeah it, it depends on the group at the time interestingly at the moment and this has never been the case i've been in the band for say 23 years and we've always had uh conservatoire students in the band and we don't have any at the moment. Um, I, I don't know why that is, whether that's coincidence or not, but we've always had two, three, four, five students that play in the band. They'll be at university or uh, college for three, four years, and then they'll go and do their whatever they're going to do, go in the forces and play, or they'll become a professional trumpet player, whatever they might fancy doing. Um, but we've got quite a mature band there now. When I say mature, some of them are in their 20s rather than, you know, teenagers ready for retirement right that's <laughs> right 20s. 26 <laughs> and you're ready, 26, for retirement. ready for retirement <laughs> so uh they uh we've got quite a quite a mature band but then uh, there's a 60 year old in every section in our band so it is quite uh, a, a mature band from that point of view um and uh so we've got anything from school teachers uh there's a head of maths in uh playing euphonium for instance we've got um what we'd call peripatetic teachers so those that go round to different colleges or schools teaching trumpet teaching trombone um there's a number of those there's classroom teachers there a lot of professionals because then they've got the time to be able to finish to to go on to to do uh what is an intense schedule of rehearsals uh but we also have um people that are plumbers um that are um involved in insurance they're involved in um what else are they involved in uh we've got a guy that sells uh trucks for a living so there, there's a lot of um backgrounds but i guess the the main thing that brings everybody together is that because they're professional they've got some control over their diaries to be able to have a friday off i mean if if i explained to you what we did two weeks ago this will put you off wanting to join our band so we set off from well, I set off from my house at 2 p.m. on a Friday. I got to the airport at 4 p.m. We were on a plane at 6 p.m. We then got to Italy. We then drove for five hours to a venue in Italy and got there at 4 a.m. We then uh, crashed, and then we had the uh, morning to about 4 p.m. off, and then we went to the rehearsal venue. We had a rehearsal in the venue from 5 to 6 30 we then did the concert at eight o'clock we then got back on a coach at 2 a.m and we traveled all the way back to the airport and then got on a plane and got back home at 10 45 a.m on the sunday so i have a question <laughs> who's like handling logistics on all of this stuff is there an admin <laughs> admin staff you know that's that's sorting tour or are you guys all they need to be fired to they need right. to be fired, whoever it is. Do, 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 it's ridiculous. Are you all, you know, I mean, is there, there's obviously people that are leadership roles that are that are sorting all of this stuff for you. Um, but but it sounds like an awful lot of work. 
Um, yeah, it's <laughs> it's manage, intense. Manage a doing, band like that, you know. You can't do that every weekend. Obviously, that that's a, that's generally a one off. But um, the reason behind that was because the, the whole it's everything's the fault of COVID, as we all know. So it doesn't matter mm. what it is. At some point, we're going to blame COVID for something. So in this instance, we were going over there two years ago and playing. Um, and normally the venue and the, the concert organizers would pay for their flights mm-hmm. and they'd pay for the, the hotel. And because two years ago, we didn't leave the airport because not everybody had had their COVID uh, passes come through on their phones because mm. you take the test we took a test the week before. We've got some uh, terrible companies uh, companies over here where they were taking samples and then sending them off to be analyzed and then sending them back, and they just never arrived. So we're mm. in an airport at 12 o'clock at night, couldn't get the plane because they wouldn't let us on because we couldn't prove that we'd got a COVID pass to say we hadn't got COVID. So we ended up not doing the concert. So the concert organizers are like, well, you're going to have to pay for your own airfare because if you don't make it, that's on you. So, of course, what do we do? We get the cheapest tickets we can with Ryanair, which is a really mm. not very reputable company over here. And uh, getting the instruments on the plane. We we had five instruments that never got there, by the way, because this is mm. this this is how it works with with cheap airlines. Um, so we got over there, and so we had to take that on the chin because we didn't make it two years ago and now i think I now that's done there'll probably be a sort of situation where they say okay things are sort of back to normal uh we we can pay for the air tickets we'll now proper, and we know a that proper it's tour gonna... this time got it yeah interesting yeah. so fascinating. we had to show willing yeah fascinating um i know you're we're running oh. out of time because you got to get to rehearsal but uh i'd love to hear about some of your projects i know you're working on a cd um, and you know, you commission a lot of music to be written and you write stuff yourself. So I'd love to just touch on that, uh, before we wrap up here. Yeah, I, I, I'm a big supporter of, uh, composers from different genres writing music for trombone. So they might not be, I mean, sometimes it helps if they understand the trombone, but I'm keen to try and find people that might write pieces that are going to be tricky for trombone because they don't understand the instrument. So I like that sort of thing. Um, this project is um, actually putting some big pieces that I've been working on over the last, say, five years. Uh, but it's also, um, and you'll know this piece of music, the Derek Bourgeois Trombone Concerto, which has been around for years and years. So I mentioned to you that I was a gardener when I was younger and I worked for this millionaire. Well, also, Derek Bourgeois was a neighbor. Uh, he lived just up the road. And my father used to go and on the weekends would be his gardener. And so he, when I was 14, he gave this music to my father and said, go and give this to your son and have a look and see what he thinks. And it's the piece of music that then Christian Lindbergh played in the UK. And it was the premiere of the Bourgeois Concerto. And me being arrogant and young, I looked at this piece of music, which looked impossible. And I said, oh yeah, that's going to be dead easy. Anybody can play that. That's not a problem. That's a dead easy piece. And sent that feedback through my father back to Bourgeois. And he's like, oh, I thought it was pretty difficult when I look. I, I thought nobody's going to play this other than Lindbergh. And I'm like, no, no. And so he's like, well, if a 14 year old can play it, it can't be that difficult. So then he made it a bit harder, I think, and then sent it off to Lindbergh. Um, and that's the piece. And I've never I've I've performed it live. Uh, a couple of times i played it in argentina i did a bit of a seminar on it in the states once i thought i need to record this piece because it's sort of quite special um and it's taken me 20 years to practice it so i've got it up standard now and i'm going to i'm going to perform it on this uh cd so that's one of the pieces which i've been keen to do for many many years and i thought now's the right time love it and then i've also got a, a will be piece which is called light fantastic which i played um a couple of years ago in a festival it was written over covid but then it was uh, available for me to play and it's uh, a similar sort of structure to the the bourgeois piece um quite high octane uh, some wonderful scoring for for the brass band and it's also written for um orchestra and, and wind band so i'm playing that and then there's some other pieces by composers like peter graham um uh, which are quite short pieces a, a gentleman who's uh, over in the states at the moment uh uh, he's uh, lecturing in Kansas, I think. He's, he's called Tom DeVoren, so he's uh, from the UK. He's written a piece which I'm going to perform and, and record. Um, and a piece by 
at Dorothy Gates, who's a trombone player in New York's... Uh, well, she was in New York. She was at the New York Staff Band um, of the Salvation Army. She's moved uh, further south now to become a minister of the Salvation Army. But she wrote this piece a couple of years ago, and so I'm going to put that on um, on CD as well. So it's it's a, a quite an encompassing project, and it's bringing lots of different strands together. Uh, but they're all UK composers, and they actually represent the four areas of the UK, so Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, and Wales. I thought that was quite neat, so I'm putting it all together, and that's that's the recording in December. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, I've brought a new website out as well, so that's quite exciting. So after uh, 10 years of looking at what I would call a Disney-esque website that I had, uh, I've sort of upgraded it and, and the e-commerce site on there is is much better. So now uh, people can buy downloads off the site and uh, there's lots of information about commissions and pieces that I would recommend. So if people are looking for music because they've not played perhaps much with a wind band before or they've not played much with a brass band and they're looking for repertoire, then there's a lot of information on there about if you want a slow piece, then have a think about this. And this is sort of this standard. Um, and if you're looking for a more difficult piece, then have a look at this. So I, there's a lot of information on the site about that, which should be of interest to people um, because I'm I'm really keen to get repertoire out there and for us not to just, uh, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we don't really have, unless we do an arrangement, we don't have a lot of Mozart and Beethoven. So um, it's good to get some quality uh, composers writing for the instrument and having some challenging but musically rewarding repertoire because uh, some of it's pretty difficult, but it's not necessarily musically rewarding. So uh, that's what I've been trying to do. That's been my mission. You'll have to tell me whether I've achieved that or not because I've no idea. I think it's great. I think it's great. Uh, all that stuff is very important for our community, and, and I think uh, definitely uh, congratulations on all that. So. Um, well, we're almost out of time. I think you got to get to your rehearsal, you. but John, uh, do you want to wrap up things for us? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I, I do want to plug this. So your, your website, Brett, is brettbaker.co.uk, correct? That's correct. Yes, that's and it. Um, do you also, are you on social media as well? Folks follow you on there or is website best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, they can get hold of me through the website, but I'm also on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram, and um, I've no idea what the handle is. Uh, I never check <laughs> these things. It's a, bit, it's a bit like when people say, what's your phone number? It's like, well, I don't know. I never have to ring myself, so <laughs> I have no idea what they are. Just push the button. Yeah, well, we'll make sure we get all those, and we'll have them in the description and show notes and all that. But, I mean, what an absolute pleasure this has been, especially with your uh, busy schedule. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, before we let you go, uh, if you could leave our listeners with one last piece of advice that you would consider your best piece of advice, what would that be? Yeah, I, absolutely. And it's it's been a pleasure talking to you both, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Um I think it goes back to when I, I went up the Twin Towers in New York. And I think it's very easy. And probably as you get older, it's even more difficult. But I think uh, the main piece of advice I would give to people is be brave. Now, you can take that however you want. But in terms of if you're thinking, oh, should I do this one thing in terms of playing this really difficult piece of music? Yes, you should. Be brave. Do it. It might be in terms of a career move where you think, oh, I'm not sure that I'm really up for this and that I should do it. And, you know, should I take that head of department job because I'm not quite ready? Be brave. Do it. So I think if you'll never regret it. And if things go wrong, what I've learned over the years is things come back round. And uh, uh, yeah, that my some of my most important experiences have been failures that have led to wonderful things as a result. So uh, don't be afraid to be brave and to fail at something because uh, actually you'll, you'll learn from it as well. Absolutely. Wonderful. wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Brett. Thank you, Brett. My pleasure. Thank, your time. thank you very much. Great to have see you Have a great show this and, weekend. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I wish good, I was good there. Luck. Good luck with the podcast. It's, uh, it's great to see you doing this stuff. Wow, that was a, a really thrilling uh, interview with Brett. I learned so much from him in the, the pretty short interview. We, and he obviously had to get to a rehearsal, but um, just could have talked to him for a long time. And uh, we'll have to definitely pick up where we left off at a, at a future episode. Um, but what a fascinating yeah. guy. I really admire his work ethic and you know uh, his diversity in, in the way that he's carved out a niche for himself. Um, artistically and, you know, from a from a business standpoint in the industry. So um, 
terrific. I think there's yeah. a lot of info there that can be helpful for our listeners. There is, yeah, there's definitely a lot to to unpack, and and I, you know, there, I hate to say there's, you know, there's a stigma sometimes for you know what we label ourselves as a professional or semi professional, and that like, and that somehow equates to your you know ability on an instrument, and he kind of blows any of that out of the water right you know like well i can't wait to hear his new cd that's a that's a the hell of a oh, repertoire man, I choice can't wait so. till that comes out yeah. yeah um but yeah i mean you can play principal trombone in the black dyke band you can be a soloist you can teach you can be a marketing director for a major company uh you can be a proponent for education and new works for brass instruments things like that you know there's never uh there's no end to what you can do in a day with a little bit of organization and and some uh, some passion behind that. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, awesome interview. I'm glad we got him on, and uh, we'll definitely have to do a volume two with him. Definitely, uh, pretty soon here. So uh, with that, we got some great guests lined up. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you give us that five star review. Uh, you know, it's funny we we see how many people listen to this episode every month. You know, and it, it's it's shocking how many folks listen. And not to, you know, put a little guilt on folks, but I see also see the number of reviews that come in. And I would say it's less than 1% of folks actually hit that five-star review or uh, that subscribe button. So maybe you can hit that that five-star review. It button. does help I know uh, I, our algorithms and stuff, right? So more people will get yeah. exposed to the trombone corner. And if you type in, you know, brass or trombone or whatever in a search, it pops up higher. And, you know, maybe, maybe more people um, can hear these interviews that we do. Yeah. I mean, even though we've been up for a number of years now, there's still folks that don't know we exist and they could be learning just like you are uh, every month. So I, d I don't say it just because I'm supposed to, because it, it actually does help. So uh, for something that you get for free, it's just a little bit way to pay us back for the hard work we do in doing this. Uh, that's all. That's enough guilt for one episode, right? <laughs> Uh, love you all. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Our, our loyal listeners, we appreciate you very much. And, uh, yeah. and looking forward to bringing more exciting Trombone Corner content very, very soon from Bob Reeves and the Brass Arc. And with that, John, why don't you take us out? Thank you for listening and keep on sliding.